in the last video we talked about World War One and how the world uh, was beginning to change after that. The Ottoman Empire <clears throat> was broken up. Russia essentially became a socialist country. Uh, we'll talk about that more in this video. Uh, Germany became a much less powerful country due to the, the Treaty of Versailles. The Austro-Hungarian Empire was split in two. Uh, and the United States had kind of emerged as a superpower. Britain and France aren't quite as powerful as they had been, but they're still, along with the United States, kind of the, the three global superpowers at this time period. Uh, the British Empire in 1922 reaches its largest height. A lot of that's thanks to land they gained from the Ottoman Empire. It was broken up. And there's a lot of short-term solutions as the world transitions out of World War I. So we'll, we'll be looking at that. Kind of how did the world um, begin to uh, come out of World War I? How did it move into the 1920s and the years following this war? And so that's what we'll be looking at. So first of all, we're going to look at the war in memoriam uh, and how people look back at World War I in the years immediately following it. There was a lot of injured soldiers. Um, there were soldiers that had injuries that were unparalleled due to the fact that there was new weaponry that, that, that caused physical harm. It, did the soldiers even survive? There's nine million soldiers who died with you know, you know, tons and tons of casualties uh, that, that weren't deaths, that were injuries. And oftentimes those soldiers were left disfigured. And so prosthetics uh, and, and making masks for face for soldiers' faces who were disfigured became very common, uh, particularly in France and Britain, but also in uh, the former central powers as well. Uh, so, so that was something that had to be addressed. There's going to be a population decline a little bit as well because obviously you have uh, all these dead soldiers who can't have children now. Um, at this point, it had been the most deadly war um, in world history. So there was a lot of shock in the people's mind. In fact, it had been known as the war to end all wars. People at this time figured it was so bad that no one would ever uh, contemplate fighting a war again if it was going to be this gruesome. Uh, the people attempted to remember the horrors of the war in a way to, to, to keep it from happening again, also to remember the soldiers who had died, so you have a lot of statues being erected. Uh, even in places like churches, um, a lot of art uh, modern art was used to express how bad the war was, but also to remember the soldiers who had died and who had been injured in the conflict. Uh, like I said, this is the lost generation because there was, a, you know, just a total population decline. Because you have all these young soldiers who can't have children now, so essentially, you know, there were people who were never born out of it, uh, not to mention those that had died themselves. Buildings and farms, particularly in France and Belgium, had been totally destroyed. And so France uh, was tasked with rebuilding itself. Uh, and it's going to need assistance largely from the United States to be able to do that. Uh, President Woodrow Wilson uh, from the United States created 14 points while he was in Europe when he went for peace talks uh, at the Treaty of Versailles. And some of these points were things like that Belgium had to be recreated. Belgium had to be a country. That places in Eastern Europe would have self-determination. That's that they would be able to decide whether they would be a country or not. Um, so it, it was the breakdown of a lot of empires. A lot of the German empire was taken away. Austro-Hungarian empire completely broke apart. Um, Russia lost a lot of land. 
and new countries like Lithuania, Poland, Latvia, Yugoslavia, these places are, are created out of uh, countries that had been in Eastern Europe. The Soviet Union is also going to be developing at this time period. Um, the coming out of the Russian Revolution. Um, after the Reds defeated the Whites in the Russian Civil War, because uh, remember, there was a bit of a civil war between the communists or the socialists and those that had backed Russia as it had been essentially. Um, they fought a civil war, but Vladimir Lenin, uh, eventually the Reds win, and Vladimir Lenin founds the Soviet Union. It was the first socialist country in the world. Um, Vladimir Lenin had a stroke in 1924, and he was replaced by Joseph Stalin um, shortly thereafter. Stalin led the Soviet Union through what's known as the Great Purge, and that was where essentially he killed off all of his political enemies, uh, were killed off. It was in order to make sure that socialism and, uh, you know, the Socialist Party stayed in power, uh, and that Stalin himself stayed in power. He also created the five year plan, which you see over here, but it was actually only four years. Uh, he called it the five year plan, oddly enough. And this was where the Soviet Union, like I had said in some of the past videos, was never really on par, had never really reached the status that uh, other places in Europe had, like the United Kingdom, France, Germany. The Soviet Union just was not as developed. Uh, it, it was like they were stuck in the early modern period when World War I started. And so after uh, the Russian Revolution, the Soviet Union is going to start to catch up with Western Europe, essentially, under Stalin. Uh, Joseph Stalin is going to take private land, um, make sure that everyone's equal, no matter what their their ethnicity or uh, whatnot. So there was a lot of equal rights between the different ethnic groups in the Soviet Union. Um, and like I said, he's going to take private land, so there aren't going to be these major farm holders. He also ended religion. He saw religion as being the enemy of the state, so he ended religion in the Soviet Union. Uh, so elsewhere in Europe, there's also some changes going on uh, in Italy, uh, which had been allied with France and uh, the United Kingdom and Russia. Uh, against the central powers, uh, Italy felt they didn't get what they deserved from the Allies when the war was over. They didn't get any land from the Ottoman Empire or any land in Eastern Europe, which is really what they wanted. They wanted control of Albania. All of that dated back to the conflict in the Balkans War, the, the land they wanted, and they didn't get the land they wanted. Uh, when they divided the German military assets, Italy didn't hardly get anything either. They divided, for example, the Zeppelin's airships that had been a part of the war. And Italy you know, was largely left out. The British and the French and the Americans got pretty much everything. There was also a lot of unemployment immediately after the war in Italy. Uh, and because of this, there's going to be uh, these two issues primarily. There's a rise of nationalism in Italy even more so than before. The war and Mussolini is elected prime minister in 1922. Um, Benito Mussolini is the founder of fascism, uh, which is going to spread into several countries in Europe. And of course, Hitler would end up being a fascist. Uh, so Mussolini used to thank for all of that. Um, so Italy was really upset, kind of how the other allies had treated them. And it leads to Mussolini rising to power and being very authoritarian and because he thought that was what was best to bring Italy out of the condition they were in. Japan also felt betrayed by the Allies, just as Italy did. Japan, though, hadn't done much for the war, uh, really, but Japan had was an ally uh, of the United Kingdom, the United States, France, in World War I. Uh, 
but largely Japan had joined the war so it could gain ex uh, islands in Asia and the Pacific. It wanted some of the German colonies in the Pacific, and it didn't get those. It, the British and the Americans got the German lands in the Pacific when they got rid of the German colonies. Uh, Japan thought they should deserve those. Uh, well, since Japan couldn't expand into the German colony, or former German colonies at this time period, in 1931, they're going to invade China, Manchuria, for expansion. Remember, they control Korea at this time, so they invade through Korea uh, into China. Now, China was already in a civil war at this time period. We discussed in the Modern East Asia video how there had been, a, in 1911, a revolution. And China goes through a lot of internal struggles. Uh, really, China was a republic for a while, and then the communists end up fighting the republic. And so China is going through a civil war, and Japan invades while China's in a civil war. And the two, the Chinese civil war essentially is put on pause at this point so that they can fight off the Japanese. But they were already weakened because they've been fighting the civil war already. Uh, Japan at this time period, the prime minister is uh, Tojo. He's essentially a fascist as well, but the emperor essentially was in many ways kind of like an absolute monarch. Remember, so Emperor Hirohito uh, along with Tojo are both, were both very powerful people in Japan at this time. And the Wenmar Republic, which is what happened in Germany. Remember, the, the German Kaiser was forced to abdicate, so Germany becomes a republic. And the Weimar Republic's created uh, to give people, you know, the right to vote and uh, elect a president and chancellor and all that. It was unpopular because it signed the Treaty of Versailles. This has been the government that had been set up after the Kaiser had to go into exile in the Netherlands. Um, but this was the republic, the, the government that signed the Treaty of Versailles. And so not a lot of people in the country are really thrilled with the government for signing this treaty that uh, limited uh, their military and economy and everything so much. In order to pay the reparations they owed primarily to Britain and France, uh, they printed money to cover the reparations, and that led to inflation. And people would have to bring like wheelbarrows full of money to the store to be able to buy bread. Uh, to a massive inflation because they were just printing money right and left. There was also 30% unemployment in Germany, and obviously people weren't thrilled about not having jobs. So all of these issues essentially uh, lead to the depression. Italy is having employment issues. Germany is. France has to rebuild. Um, the Americans are having to pay for all this, but only Finland was the only country that paid the United States back. So you have a lot of different issues going on that lead to the economy of the world essentially being in a bad condition. Um, but prior to the depression, there was a lot of new technologies that have been created in the 1920s. Uh, the radio became more widespread, cars became more widespread. It was a time of thriving, particularly in the United States um, and the United Kingdom in large part as well. A uh, time of thriving after World War One, even in other places that, that weren't doing as well in Europe. Uh, it was known in the United States as the Roaring Twenties because uh, there was a lot of cultural and social change. But eventually, all of this led to the stock market crash in the United States in 1929. And the United States had really been kind of helping to keep Europe on its feet. And so when the United States stock market crashes, that's going to lead to the, uh, even higher unemployment in the United States. And they're not able to help Europe as much. The banks failed, which created even further problem unemployment in the United States. And it couldn't fund the European economy like I was saying. And so the entire world enters into a depression in the 1930s. And that's just going to help these fascist figures like Hitler rise to power in places like Germany, largely thanks to them not even being thrilled with the Weimar Republic anyway. And so all of this events after World War I leads directly to the start of a Second World War.